So here's what I want to talk about, folks. Something that matters to all of you, I hope. Something that matters to me because it's my life. It's about diversity at Gettysburg College. Here's why. Because it matters. And I'm going to end with the same thing I start with, and it is this. Do you know anything about this year's birth rate and its ethnic makeup in the United States? <coughs> Some of you may not know. But this year, and I'm going to speak in real terms, more than half of the babies born in the United States were some shade of brown. In 18 years, where are those brown kids going to be? Going to college. So think about the Gettysburg College you know now, you who are about to be diploma holders, and then think about whether you want that diploma to have value because Gettysburg College is either still in business or not. Diversity matters. To put it in crass terms, Apple figured it out. I'm not talking about the fruit, I'm talking about the company. I'm sure, and this is not product placement, but the Zoom made by Microsoft or whatever that MP3 player is probably is a fine piece of equipment. But the iPod sold to every culture and the commercials showed it. I'm sure that New Balance is a great shoe, but Nike sold to every culture in the world and will never, ever be toppled. So diversity is money, because I'm certain that Microsoft would love to have the Apple share of portable music players, what people in my generation never dreamed of, because we had something about as big as that banner called a jukebox. <laughs> Let me explain what this is. So there used to be something made of vinyl called a 45, so called because it rotated 45 revolutions per minute. It was small, about seven inches, but what would happen is you would have to push these buttons really hard. I want song number B7 because it's ABC by the Jackson 5. And then this thing that looked like a grappling hook would go in <laughs> and somehow get this 45 that you punched B7 to get. It grasped it, put it onto a turntable, and the tone arm, tone arm came over. And for five seconds you heard what we called bacon frying. And then the music started. And if you played the song enough, you knew where the click and pop was between verses. What's my point? Fast forward. Now, I have 25,000 songs in something in my jacket that I would have needed, I don't want to know how many of those, to tote around. But Apple figured out that if I don't just sell to wealthy suburbanites, but instead I sell to the world, I'm going to make more money. Because the world is beginning to brown. Nike figured it out. If I sell to China, because there are a lot of people living in China, if I sell to Africa, because contrary to Tarzan movies, Africans wear shoes. <laughs> Shocking. Yeah. Talk to Alan, he wears shoes. <laughs> yeah, I made it real, didn't I? Crazy. So all those crazy Kenyans who are running all over the place, winning every race, they wear shoes. And the only African who didn't where shoes was Zola Bud? She was white. 
Nike and Apple figured it out. Let's think again about what these kids who are browner are going to need to do in 18 years. They're going to colleges. Now, you can either assume that this one year thing was a blip and that all the brown people are going to say, wow, that's enough of that. <laughs> Let's go back to letting the white people have all the babies. Let's just quit it. Or maybe it's a trend. In my business, we know it's the start of a trend because my job in order to be successful in admission requires me to know the birth rate now so that I know what's happening 18 years from now. When some of you will be 40, some of you will be 36, some of you will be retired. <laughs> and when I say you, I mean me. <laughs> so why be different? I want to tell a story about a young man by the name of Michael Brooks who sadly passed away recently. But this was a schoolyard happening. He came to me and said, Jones. And I said, okay, I guess you mean me. I don't know whether to fight you or be your buddy. And I said, okay, why? He said, and I quote, you hang out with those band and orchestra kids, which makes me want to fight you because you're a nerd. But you're on all the cool sports teams, which means I'm supposed to like you. Now this was seventh grade. There was no such thing as bullying at that time, so I said, well, Michael, let me tell you something. I've been studying martial arts since the ripe old age of four, because I was 12, so that was a long time back then. You don't want to fight me because it would be embarrassing for you. We became fast friends because he was confused. <laughs> Michael was confused a lot in life. So the difference for me, started early. Why be different? Why not? Do you have to try to? No. Because what you think is different is going to look the same. Like all the kids in high school who say, I'm going to wear all black to be unique. <laughs> which is going to make me look like everybody else who wears black <laughs> to be unique. Difference means you go against the grain. You don't do what was done before because it was supposed to be done over and over, because it wasn't broken. You do it because solutions lie in difference. They lie in difference. Here's how it works. And I want you to think for a moment. Places like Howard University, Places like Spelman are called historically black colleges and universities. Well, I want you to think of Gettysburg College and Princeton and Yale and Bates and Bowdoin and Colby as historically white. Then I want you to question this. If Howard and Spelman in those places are called historically black, What the heck is the reason we don't call all the other institutions historically white? Because they are. So how do you change history? If you had the job of making Howard University less black, so you were the person who had to whiten Howard University, how would you do it? If you decided, I'm going to take on the ultimate challenging job and recruit white students to Howard University, how would I do it? What would I need to have in place? What would I need to have to construct? And how would I make it happen? Every time I'm in a commission meeting, Every time I talk to people about diversifying, because I consult for many institutions, 
I start with that example. Instead of doing something a little less harsh, like saying, well, let's say you had an all-male institution. How would you mix it gender-wise? Why do I do it that way? Because it's how you have to think if you're going to make a difference. Think about it. These are conversations that really happened at places that I've worked. You know, they're paying me to be a consultant. These are real things. I've asked, so what do you think you need to have in order to make this thing work? Get more Asian students, Latino students, in international students, African American students. What do you need? People have said, well, you know, you, you could serve some chi Chinese food or something in the, <laughs> you know, you could have a theme night where it's Chinese food because, you know, then Asian Americans will like it because you can say, well, one time we had Chinese food in the dining hall and so now you should come because, you know, we're cool now. What about African Americans? Well, you could, you could, you'd have, you know, black stuff <laughs> at your college. Well, what do you mean by that? You know, things that black people like. <laughs> well, people make the assumption that different brown or yellow cultures are monolithic. I look across the room, I read all of your applications, I know that in being Caucasian, whatever that's supposed to mean, there's no monolithic culture in this room. There isn't. So when you think about diversity and whether or not you want Gettysburg College to be in business 18 years from now, think about how we make it a place that embraces different cultures. Why does it matter? Because smarts don't reside in just one race. Smarts don't reside in just one socioeconomic level. So if you assume, which is safe to do, that there are lots of smart people of all sorts of backgrounds, this year's birth rate in 18 years who was going to college, I can assume we'll have an intelligence distribution that is a little more brown. Now you might think, so this guy Daryl Jones, pretty confident about what he does, because we have a world-beating, a world-beating partnership that Julie's division and my division work together. It is something that most places try to emulate but can't. We started with an organization called Philadelphia Futures that picks the best of the best from inner city Philadelphia and gives them help with retention, brings them to your school, and lets you know that you're going to get a successful student. Not one that you're reaching down and saying, oh, I've got to help this poor Philadelphia kid but someone who's going to come and dominate, someone whose options were Cornell, or Bates, or Gettysburg. It's your job, folks, to make this the place that's more attractive than Cornell, or Bates. So Philadelphia Future started, and we went from, and I want you to hear this correctly, I'm not talking percentages, a hope that 10 students of color would enter in a class because that would double what it was in the 70s which would quadruple what it was in the 60s 10 in a class to having more than 10 percent of each entering class in a college that is considerably larger now that's where it started but there's more. This partnership and the Sunite Waldemarian video that a lot of you probably saw that was featured on Last Word, MSNBC and lots of other things, did you see it? Just fake it and say you did. Yeah. Very good, because you're on camera. <laughs> well, we've done a lot of great things, but I was not always this successful at being different. Here was difference. 
was probably the only kid who took martial arts beginning at age four. So I knew I was hop keto, which is called, you're going to hurt yourself, but we're not going to tell you how until you're in it 20 years. Let me tell you about failure and how difference and doubt can hurt you. So at a certain point, you have to do the illogical. I had to break concrete with these hands. And if you look at them, you'll see that I'll never be a hand model. My hands are ugly. My wife tells me, honey, your hands are ugly. <laughs> well, when I was taking that test, I had to break concrete. So I got fired up. I was listening to my Walkman. This was 1985. The Walkman was a cassette. You don't know what that is, but it's like a 45 except this way. <laughs> it's big as a brick, and you needed to lift weights to carry it. So I was listening to my favorite Earth, Wind and Fire tune, which I recorded from an album to a cassette. Got fired up. Well, the physics behind it is that you have to move at about 45 or 50 miles an hour to break that concrete. Within the last half inch, even though my hand was moving at 45 miles per hour, I tried to stop and I failed miserably and broke every bone on this hand. My sensei said, Jones, you will try it with the left hand. And I said, that's cool. <laughs> you know, seven or eight months from now, I got this. He said, now, Jones. Now, I was crying, bleeding. My fingers looked like a crazy road sign. But I tried again, saying, well, at least I'm not going to do that again. And I moved at 45 or 50 miles an hour, and I tried to stop. And this hand got broken. Why did I say that? Because failure taught me humility. Failure taught me that with all the accolades that we receive because of our partnership, I don't get arrogant. I get hungry for more success. We're not going to be the Apple or Nike of diversity. We're going to get there, though, because each one of you is going to get a degree that you want to increase in value. Each one of you, when you are 40, and I'm 50, I know, people live this long, imagine it. <laughs> you want your degree to carry lots of weight so that you can keep moving up the ladder and eventually retire. You want your degree to be something that your grandkids can be proud enough to have your corporate and educational and medical and legal buddies will want the degree that you hold because you did something to keep it in business. So I ask you just to think of this. Because in 18 years I'll be retired, but I'm still going to care about a place from which I did not graduate. I care deeply and have lots of love for lots of graduates, many of whom come back to be professors and make me even more proud. Do you want your degree to mean something or be obsolete? Do you want your degree, and no offense to Microsoft, if any of you have parents or lawyers especially who work for Microsoft, <laughs> do you want to be the iPod or the Zoom? It's in your hands. It's in your hands. Diversity matters because it's money in your pocket or cache to your degree. 18 years from now, let's make it matter together. Thank you.